um, to celebrate the end of the meeting. So, yeah, with that, thanks, Molly. <laughs> Okay, so as you might have noticed from the slide that's on the screen, unfortunately, um, Lucy Noel was not able to make it uh, this morning. And so two of our members of the board of directors have very graciously allowed me to twist their arms to uh, prepare a talk at the last minute. Um, and so uh, Dave Heinemann and Mike Gusef are going to give a little uh, tag team set of talks on some of the work that they're doing. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, so Dave will go first. Um, Dave, is, Dave Heinemann is, a, is professor and chair of the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Michigan State. He did his master's and PhD at Stanford, his master's in applied earth sciences and his PhD in hydrogeology. Um, he's the chair of our board, the Quasi Board. He has many honors and awards. Uh, some of them are serving as the Darcy Lecture, the NGWA Darcy Lecture. Um, he's a GSA Fellow, and he is a Big Ten University's uh, Executive Officer Fellow. His research interests are varied, but they include uh, looking at the impacts of changes in climate and land use on water fluxes and ecology, which I think is what he'll be talking about today. And also, he's done a lot of work in developing novel methodologies for aquifer characterization, um, combining physical and chemical processes to understand flow and transport in hydrogeologic systems. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dave Heinemann. Thank you, Holly, and thank you all for coming this morning. So the work I'm presenting today is mainly on a water sustainability and climate project that we're getting near the end of, funded by National Science Foundation. We have a big multidisciplinary team where most of the team is at Michigan State University and part of the team is at the Kansas Geological Survey with Jim Butler sitting in the back. And if you saw his talk, he presented some of the work that they've been doing. I'm just gonna present some of the work that has been going on from our side of the team on quantifying the impact of human activities on water sustainability and crop yields across this incredibly important aquifer. So this aquifer is the largest in the United States. It spans eight states from South Dakota all the way down to Texas. And it's an incredible area to study the impacts of human activities because it's got this huge gradient in the actual impact that's being observed. So the diagram shows the level of changes in yield through time from pre-development <clears throat> to current, where the blue basically shows fairly stable levels, so fairly sustainable water up in the northern portion up here in Nebraska. As you move farther down to the south, you see more and more yellow to red colors, which indicate changes in saturated thickness up to about 75%. It's actually even worse than that. Many of the areas down in the southern high plains have actually already gone dry and had to shift over to dry land agriculture. So another way of showing this is to look at all of this through time from the 30s up until current. This is across the total aquifer, so total aquifer volume in cubic kilometers. And you can see rather dramatic decline and fairly steady decline from the 30s. It's really increased in the 1950s and that was really due to the advent of center pivot irrigation systems, which vastly increased the amount of irrigation across the region. So the total decline is almost 400 cubic kilometers. It's a hard number to actually put a handle on. So one way of thinking about this is the volume of Lake Erie is pretty close to that. Now that's the decline, not the use. So a huge change in this system due to anthropogenic activities. If we separate these out in terms of percent of this pre-development pre water level, the northern high plains here is in orange, and again you see overall fairly stable. The central high plains has had reductions now on average about 25% of the saturated thickness. The southern high plains closer to 50%. So this is a rather dramatic change in a short period of time, and again, one of the main reasons we decided to study this aquifer. 
On top of this, we have climate change. And the climate change projections for this region are it'll be about three to four degrees Celsius warmer by the end of the century. And it will be wetter in the areas to the north that already are somewhat sustainable. And it'll be substantially drier down to the south. So this is about a 9% decline in projected precipitation and about an 8% increase to the north. So the areas that are already challenged are projected to get even more challenged going into the future. On top of that, <clears throat> we have very different kinds of human activities in management. And farmers are effectively running a business trying to do the best they can to keep their business going into the future. One thing they've done is they've adopted new irrigation technologies. So down at the bottom you see through time the colors linked to the kind of irrigation. So irrigated areas in millions of hectares. So back in the early 1990s you had almost half of the systems being flood irrigation and about half being sort of center pivot is the, the high spray center pivot. And through time, flood decreased, and then this LEPA type of system came in, which basically has drop pipes to be more efficient at getting the water where you need it. And that has basically taken over the vast majority of irrigation across the region. One of the interesting things that you would think is, so this is more efficient getting water where you need it. But through our analysis, we found farmers aren't using less water. They have a water allotted to them, and they have a more efficient technology. They're either going to put it on new land, or they're going to just put more on by putting it around more times. So although it's more efficient in terms of the crop yield per drop of water you put on, it's not necessarily using less water. <clears throat> so we did a variety of things in this project, including data synthesis, which I'll show you some of. But a lot of what we've done is coupled systems models. And I'll first talk about what we've done with the WARF climate model. So it's a regional climate model. And we decided for this system, it's absolutely critical to have a module that describes how irrigation works. Because it, irrigation in this high plains aquifer is a critical component of the water balance. So we had to write our own irrigation module for this community code something Lisa Pay and our group did. I'll then move on to talk about the landscape hydrology model, which we wrote in our group as full energy balance, water balance code to basically predictively describe how these systems work. We also wrote an irrigation mod module for that. We also have done a lot of work with the crop growth model. So actually talking about how plants actually grow above ground carbon, below ground carbon, how they use water, how they use nutrients. And that's an incredible model to evaluate changes in management through time. We've also done a lot of work coupling in socioeconomics, irrigation adoption, and we have models to talk about the spread of these irrigation technologies. I don't have time to talk about that today. So this first phase of climate modeling, one of the things we wanted to figure out is what is the implication of the irrigation across the entire continental US on downwind precipitation and temperature? Again, if it's an important part of the water balance, it probably has some significant effects. So we wrote this module in WARF that basically, first of all, we identify based on a remote sensing, where is irrigation actually occurring at times? And then we say, if there's a soil moisture deficit in agricultural land, where we know that at times there's irrigation, we then turn on irrigation and actually apply this water as excess rainfall. So this is from the model. And you see in a dry year, 2012, the main irrigated areas across the United States stand out quite clearly. We have the Central Valley of California, which of course we heard a lot about through this most recent drought, which has very intensive irrigation. The High Plains Aquifer here, the Southern Mississippi River Valley, and then an area basically from the Columbia River Plateau down into Idaho. So we're simulating all of these, and we can run one simulation with irrigation on, one with the irrigation off, and compare what actually occurs in terms of downwind uh, climate. So first, you're adding a bunch of moisture to the atmosphere, and what we see is downwind of areas like the High Plains Aquifer, you get more precipitation. You add more water, there's more water to fall out of the precipitation. 
And one of the things that was a little bit surprising is the drying that you see in part of the uh, area out to the west. Well, it turns out if you add this moisture, you change the bulk circulation patterns in the atmosphere, and it has a rather dramatic effect. You can say, well, how do we know this is even realistic? Well, we compare this to the actual observed precipitation. And for those who have done a lot of regional climate modeling, they'll know there's a basically a regional pattern that these models generally don't fit, where the models are too dry relative to the observations. We add this irrigation, and it solves most of that problem. Something that came more as a surprise to me was the effect that this actually had on temperatures. So you're adding moisture in areas like like across the high plains, and there are now clouds downwind, you're actually cooling much of the eastern United States, especially in dry years. But you're also, because of the changes in circulation, you're warming areas to the west that are quite arid. So pretty dramatic changes as a result of irrigation. Now moving on to the landscape hydrology model. So you can just think of this as a process-based model that it simulates all aspects of the hydrologic cycle, including everything associated with snowpack and snowmelt and the interaction with plants and the atmosphere. It's a multi-layer model in the unsaturated zone and feeds into a groundwater code, and we basically couple that mass balance back into surface water routing where we can compare what's happening in the stream system. This model uses what we would call big data. It ingests a huge amount of data on an hourly basis where it's available and remote sensing every eight days to figure out what's happening in the landscape and predict what's happening hydrologically. So today I'm going to focus in on the central high plains portion of the domain, so basically mostly from Kansas down toward Texas. This particular subdomain of the model is about 385,000 square kilometers with one square kilometer cells and it has multiple cells vertically. So you some of the types of data that feed into this. So we have Sergo hydraulic conductivity data. So Sergo comes out of the USDA and we have polygons that tell us something about soil properties. If anyone's tried to use this, it's an incredible data set, but you find a lot of inconsistencies across things like county boundaries. Like all of a sudden the hydraulic conductivity changes at a county boundary, which obviously is not reality. So we had to do a lot of work to actually come up with a product that is fairly seamless and provides the hydraulic data that we need to drive the model, which is very important to understand the recharge dynamics. We use remote sensing in a variety of senses. The most important one is leaf area index from the MODIS satellite. So every eight days, the satellite goes over. We have a one kilometer, eight day product since 2000. This is just a snapshot of that in July across this whole region. And effectively, it tells you the number of leaves from the atmosphere down to the ground. The more leaves they are or the more thick the canopy is, the more vegetation that's available to take up water. So you look across this system and you see higher leaf area index off to the east, where it's much more humid, there's more water available, and much lower, very close to zero, out in the western portion, where it's much more arid. So we have a huge gradient in precipitation from dry to wet. Now you'll notice in the central portion here, there's a lot of blue that shows up. But what's going on there? Well, that's irrigation, right? So even out here where it's very arid, they're irrigating. So you have these dense canopies of things like corn. For precipitation, we can use a wide range of products. We can use gauge data and distribute that across space. We can use NEXRAD radar data. But we found that the best product in terms of having something that's consistent and hourly over a long period of time are these data assimilation products like NLDAS. So they basically assimilated things including radar data and we pull that in. It doesn't look very pretty when you put it in this kind of color scale. But at least when you run this through the models, it's pulled together basically almost all the available data for climate. And again, you can see that big climate gradient. You have more than a factor of two change in precipitation from dry here to wet on this side. <clears throat> we run this all through the model. And I'm just showing you here the average predicted 
and DAPA transpiration from 2008 to 2014. And this is in centimeters per year. And not surprisingly, you see a strong gradient, more evapotranspiration off in the more humid areas to the east and much less to the west. And also, you see the overprinting of the irrigation areas. Because again, this model, we wrote an irrigation module in this that turns on irrigation when it needs to be turned on. So all these blue areas are areas that are being irrigated. The other kinds of changes you see, other patterns are associated with land use and soil types across the domain. It's also feed into the system. We can then take that further and get to something that long term we care a little bit more about and how much of this water actually gets back into the ground as recharge, either as natural rain falling in the ground becoming recharged or irrigation return flow. And similar kinds of patterns, the wet areas are getting more recharge but also areas in this central portion that have irrigation also get more irrigation return flow turning into recharge. Now I want to shift before I talk about crop modeling into some recent data synthesis that we've been doing to try to understand the implications of irrigation across the domain. So there's incredible data available from the USDA county basis and some finer than that to tell you about what's happening with irrigation, what's happening with yield, and what's happening with management. So we've mined this data set to look through time across this central high plains region from the 70s to current. And this is yield in megagrams per hectare for corn and for wheat. And the dashed lines are irrigated, the solid lines are non-irrigated. So the one thing that you'll notice right off the bat, and not surprising at all, if you irrigate, you dramatically increase yield, both with corn and wheat. It's roughly a doubling of the, the yield. So you wonder why do farmers irrigate? Well, if they can double their actual yield, that's a huge difference to their businesses. The other thing you might notice is that both non-irrigated and irrigated corn increase their yield fairly dramatically through time. There's been incredible development in cultivars and management and technologies for corn because it's a huge business across the U.S. and, in fact, across the world. Now, in wheat, you do see, for irrigated wheat, you see substantial increases through time because of changes in irrigation technologies and some other management technologies, whereas the non-irrigated stays fairly flat. So there haven't been big adoptions of like new cultivars in wheat because, again, it's not fitting within the business model. So that might be something in the future that does happen. So we went further with this to say, well, what's happening in terms of the growth of numbers of acres of corn and wheat, again, irrigated and total? So you see corn from the 70s to 80s and then slower growth after that, massive change huge increases in the number of acres across the domain. It's flattened out now, and that's mostly because of water limitations. Whereas with wheat, so most of the wheat is non-irrigated. Most of this is winter wheat. They put it in in areas that are fairly dry, and they let go. The irrigated wheat is a low proportion, and it stayed fairly stable. So most of that's dry land keep going in the analysis to figure out from the farmer's perspective, does it actually make sense to irrigate? So really for them, it's going to come in down to, to dollars, but we first have to figure out what happens to a change in yield with irrigation. So basically kilograms per hectare of increase. And here you see with corn, you have a massive increase in yield with irrigation. You see an increase for wheat but not nearly as much. What's happened through the water applications through time to any particular spot that is actually irrigated? It has fairly dramatically decreased by more than a factor of two. And again, a lot of that is a shift in technology from flood irrigation to center pivot to LEPA. So on a particular spot, you're actually applying less water. Well, now let's take it one more step. So the yield gain per water applied, and this is commonly referred to as crop per drop. How much extra crop do you get per drop of water you put on the landscape? 
and you see that both corn and wheat have substantial increase, corn much more, and that increase is much more substantial through time. So most of the irrigation that's gone in, not surprisingly, is in corn. On top of this, we now overlay the costs of these commodities through time. Because again, that's the thing that the farmers are going to make decisions based on. Now this is dollars that they're going to get as return per hectare per millimeter they put on the ground. So they're basically going to get about $2 per hectare per millimeter they put on the ground for corn. But then there's this huge spike. What happened there? Corn prices went through the roof. Basically, the, the biofuels mandate and the massive surge caused corn to go up to like from three to seven dollars per bushel, and it's now gone way back down. So, so if you wonder why there's a big shift in the landscape that like went almost entirely to corn and now is being more diverse, it comes down to profit. Whereas for wheat, it stayed relatively stable through time. So the last main phase I want to go through is let's take this even farther and do crop modeling. So it's a systems model, a predictive model of how plants actually grow. We do initial phase of this through time where we look at irrigated yield, in this case for corn. So everything before this dash line is the historical period where the green is the data from the USDA and then this black is the average of the models run across the domain. So we run it spatially, you average those, you get this black line. So the first thing you can see is the model does a pretty good job of reproducing historical behavior, and this is not a calibrated model. Then we say, you've seen these increases in yield, if we go forward without any adaptation, we don't do what we've done in the past, because we don't know what future adaptation will be. And we have climate change. So you can see at the climate change scenario, RCP 4.5, which is the low end of what's likely, you can basically maintain yields through time. If you go to the higher ones, like 8.5, you see dramatic decreases in yield. Now, clearly farmers are not going to find that acceptable. They would be trying to figure out something to do to deal with that. This does not involve water limitations. This just involves the climate change component. What about for wheat? So again, the historical period, the model does pretty well describing the historic wheat yield. Interestingly, you see the yields are actually going up a little bit. Well, wheat is a C3 plant. So C3 plants actually, as you put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you get fertilization of the plant and yields can increase. So they're much less sensitive to climate change going forward. On top of this, of course, we do have water level decline. We have more and more areas that we're not going to be able to irrigate into the future. So here we project it out. So the red areas are already not useful for irrigation, at least high volume irrigation. The yellow by 2050 we project will be unusable. And by the end of the century, the green ones will be unusable, leaving just the white across this domain. So we combine this with this other information in this model to say what happens to crop production, the total amount you can get across the domain with available water. And here, again, we see these increases up to current. Now we start having both climate change effects and water limitations. And no matter what forward projection we have for climate change, we have dramatic reductions in production. So this is really rather concerning. Now, the Dry land does okay, because you don't have that water limitation. Wheat, you basically have most of it in dry land, and again, the production can actually increase through time. There's two effects that are here. One is the CO2 fertilization. The other is, basically, if you're losing land from corn, some of that's going to end up going into wheat. The final phase is we're looking at regional crop modeling across effectively the entire corn belt. So these are annual projections from these crop models to say what's actually happening in terms of yield. And you're seeing big changes from year to year because much of this domain is dry land agriculture. And if you have a dry year, you don't get nearly as much production. 
We're also doing some work now on precision agriculture with Bruno Basso, where he's both using low-flying aircraft with hyperspectral imagery and a drone that we like saw from Scott Tyler, we've gone through that whole process to get licensed to fly it. And you can fly over these fields with regular visible or thermal or near infrared imagery, and you see these dramatic kinds of stress on the crop system, both due to water and nitrogen stress. So what we're trying to figure out is how can precision agriculture play a role going into the future to try to improve the utilization of water and nutrients while still keeping crop levels high. So in summary, the Central and Southern High Plains are clearly very far from sustainable operation. They're pulling out way too much water for long term. The climbs, again, about 400 cubic kilometers. Irrigation does alter regional climate and really needs to be incorporated in both the climate models and hydrology models to describe these systems. On top of this, climate change is going to exacerbate all kinds of water and food production challenges that we face. We need substantially more food going into the future, and we're having these kinds of issues that are going to challenge us even keeping yields the same as they are today. And finally, we're doing a lot of work now on analyzing this precision agriculture in a sense that can they help stabilize water levels while keeping yields similar across the region? Thank you. So the one I showed right here is not, and part of that is it, it's hard to tell, and what we are trying to do right now is to say, if there's not irrigation available, will they switch from irrigated corn to dryland corn or to wheat? And that switch largely depends on what the climate is, so that's the next phase in that analysis. So in, in terms of the intensification, we were surprised by the numbers as well. And again, we looked at the dry bias that exists in these regional climate models, and it's substantial. So the model with the irrigation described much better what we actually observe in terms of data. In terms of the changes of the, the kinds of crops that are being put in, we've gone through historical analysis to say what's there. Going forward, it's much more difficult to project what are people going to do in the future. Um, it, that's where we're working with our socioeconomic team to say not just irrigation adoption, but given the kinds of challenges we're going to face in the future, basically run scenarios of the, the kinds of adoption of different kinds of crops and different kinds of management. So we are looking at that. <laughs> sure, they'll pump the water over to you the atmosphere. Thanks, Dave, for that really nice example of integrating a lot of different types of data into models for a society, societally relevant problem. Um, so now I think we'll uh, move to some different types of data, some, some time series data um, that Mike Gusev will, will tell us about. Mike is an associate professor at the University of Colorado Boulder in the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Architectural Engineering. He received his master's and PhD also at uh, UC Boulder in Civil Engineering. Um, he has won numerous awards for teaching and mentoring. Um, he is a National Academy of Engineering Frontiers of Engineering Education faculty member. Um, his research interests uh, span 
stream groundwater surface water interactions, uh, contaminant fate and transport, polar earth system response to climate change, um, and aquatic biogeochemical cycling, among others. Mike is the lead PI of the McMurdo Dry Valleys LTER, and I think that's what he'll tell us about. Mike. Okay, I think, as they used to say, now for something completely different. Um, so uh, I am the lead PI of the McMurdo LTER, and I did my PhD work in the late 90s down in the Dry Valleys, and I was very lucky to become part of this um, interdisciplinary team. And, uh, you know, if you stick around long enough, yada, 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 everybody moves on to other things, and you end up becoming the lead PI. So um, let that be a lesson to all you students out there. You can decide your fate, I guess. But uh, um, no, it's, it's a, it is actually a, a real privilege to um, work with this group for a long period of time, and it's find my research um, and my direction far beyond just being in Antarctica. But um, coming back to the theme of the biennial, I really wanted to focus on what we've done with data. This, this project is now in its 23rd year. We get funded on six-year intervals, so we're towards the end of our fourth uh, interval of funding. And um, I'm happy to say that we've been recommended for renewal for um, another installment starting next year, so we will have 30 years of the McMurdo LTER, which is really gratifying. So um, this is what the landscape looks like. There are no trees. We will not be talking about farming. Um, and and you know, this is a little darker than I expected, but we have these glaciers that come down from the mountains uh, in the dry valleys. The dry valleys are kept dry because of very um, strong catabatic or foam winds that blow down these valleys off the polar plateau. Um, we also don't get, we get about less than 10, um, less than five centimeters of, of water equivalent precipitation on the valley floors in the winter, and it really does bunch up like this. You, we don't get blankets of snow. Blankets of snow that fall during the summer, the austral summer, uh, tend to um, uh, sublimate very quickly. So um, our, our mean annual temperatures are about minus uh, 19C, and um, we go to you know minus 40s in the winter, um, and just above freezing during the summer. So uh, this is this is the PI team, though. This is a really great group of folks, and, and uh, we are at about 10 different institutions, 12 PIs, uh, and it's been a, a there's a lot to learn from every one of these. So um, I'm giving this talk, but it is on behalf of a, a, a really fantastic um, broad group of, of uh, um, excellent scientists. Okay, so an LTER is set up for cutting edge uh, research on uh, ecosystem processes. I'm going to focus this more on some of the hydrology work we've done and sort of ignore some of that biological and, and, and uh, ecosystem perspective just because of this crowd, because because I know you guys are here for water. So um, this is, this is, this is uh, biology in action. These are uh, seals that wander their way up into the valleys off the coast and then uh, tend to um, run out of sardines. But um, LTER, for, for context, it's, um, you know, the, these are six-year projects. Um, oh, how would I? Okay. Um, we, we can, you know, look at short-term um, uh, experiments on the scale of, let's say, a graduate student's, you know, thesis or dissertation. Um, but ultimately, you know, we are in it for the long run, and the idea of having a network allows us to start to compare what happens among sites to try to come up with new, um, potentially, you know, universal uh, ecological principles. In our system, we, we are looking a lot at, at climate change and physical um, uh, drivers and, and ecological responses. Um, but ultimately, it is this database that we collect, and, and I would say, I, I would emphasize here that there is sort of a this two um, two pronged approach to LTERs, where you are doing a lot of monitoring, um, and you are expected to monitor your ecosystem and do the cutting edge, sexy science. So, so having to do both of those does cost a lot. Um, but you know, coming back to these these uh, these data don't really work; they don't become long term unless you put in the effort every year to go out and get them. So, all right. Stating the obvious. All right, so this is this is the Dry Valleys. It's uh, the largest ice-free area of Antarctica. <clears throat> um, most of our work is focused here in Taylor Valley, Lake Frixel, Lake Hoare, and Lake Bonnie. Um, these are um, this area was discovered by Robert Falconer Scott's uh, team back in 1910, and um, and they sort of thought this was a completely lifeless area. Well, we we now know that life is just very small there. Um, we also have some work going on in Wright Valley. Um, you can see it does not open up to McMurdo Sound. There's a Piedmont Glacier here and Lake Vanda in the center. Um, and the longest uh, river in Antarctica, at the surface anyway, is the Onyx River, which starts up here and works its way inland to terminate at Vanda. All four of these lakes, lakes that are closed basin lakes, so they don't have an outlet to the, uh, 
to the ocean, and that, that means they're wonderful integrators of climate to some extent. We'll, we'll come back to that in just a second. The other thing I'm going to, I'm going to talk about some stream work that we've done over the years, and really these are streams that come off of these glaciers and work their way into uh, Lake Frixell over here. So um, I'll talk a little bit about long and short streams. We don't have to worry about which ones are where, um, but just note that they're, they're in this basin that it has about 15 streams or so coming into that, that lake. So, so this is what it looks like more or less from the ground. This is actually from a helicopter, but we've got these lakes that have permanent ice covers. Those might be four to five meters thick. Um, we get moats that open up around the edges, and these glaciers come down from the, the, the mountains, and, and the melt that we get that, that goes into the streams really comes from these lower elevations of the glacier that are near the, um, the, uh, the valley floors. Um, life is small in this ecosystem, so we spend a lot of time in the lakes looking at um, algal mats on, the, on the, the lake beds. We do a lot of work with phytoplankton now in the uh, wa lake water columns. Um, and we also have um, really interesting uh, algal mats and so forth that get incorporated into the ice covers as well. Um, in the streams, we have uh, extensive algal mats which just dry out in between flow seasons. Um, so right now, they are dried and waiting for water. Come November, hopefully they'll get some melt and they start photosynthesizing within an hour or so of getting wet. Um, in the glacier ice, we even have these um, what we call cryokinite holes. These are basically uh, deposits of sediment and um, uh, cyanobacterial matter that has been blown up onto the glacier, collected enough, and then started to melt its way in. So you get these little tiny sort of mesocosms. And then in the soils, we have only a handful of um, microinvertebrates here, nematodes and tardigrades, which is a little water bear here. Um, and it's been really interesting to look at their dynamics through time as, as uh, temperatures rise and fall, and as um, we look at salinity, salinity gradients across this landscape. But back to the streams. Um, these streams are really interesting because they dry out annually, um, and then they, they have this interesting daily flood pulse to them because all of our, just about all of our water comes right off of these glaciers. We don't have a lot of snowpack, and when snow falls on these glaciers, we raise the albedo and actually depress the, the melting, right? So, so it's a little frustrating when you're on the stream team, you know, wanting to go around and gauge streams. Um, when it snows, you have to wait for that snow to, get to, to disappear before you can get to that um, dirty ice underneath that'll melt a little better. But these stream gauges were set up by the uh, USGS. We have um, uh, Diane McKnight was uh, uh, a USGS um, researcher back when she started with the LTER. And um, we had this expertise coming down for quite some time, and that's changed a little bit with budget constraints. But, um, but we have this wonderful network set up. So there's about 18 gauges set up throughout the valleys, a variety of different valleys. And some of them are these sort of sandbag walls. Some of them have um, flumes in them. Some of them are natural controls. Um, and, and we've been monitoring these. Every 15 minutes, we get stage, which we convert to discharge by going out and making a lot of measurements, temperature, and electrical conductivity. So that's a wonderful database from which to work. So here's kind of a typical season for a long stream, delta stream. It, um, electrical conductivity is in green. You can see it starts out very high in the 300s, microsiemens per centimeter, drops down, sort of dilutes a bit as we get the higher flows coming through in the middle of the austral summer. And then things can die out. There can be periods of no flow or very, very low flow through the summer, um, and then things may pick back up. So it's not uncommon to have flow from sort of late November, early December through the middle of, of February or maybe beyond, depending on the season. The trouble is that we get kicked out of the field um, in late January, and in fact, um, we have to be off the continent um, by about mid-February. So uh, it's a bit of a challenge to know what's going on out here. We rely on, on um, multiple lines of evidence to try to um, corroborate our, our records. So here's a long stream, though, delta stream, as I mentioned. And here's a short stream. So here's Canada stream. It's about one kilometer long. And notice that the flow peaks are shifted a little bit. The, the daily flood comes through slightly differently at each location, partly because of travel time off the glacier and the aspect of that glacier. Are you north facing or south facing, et cetera? And so the other thing you'll notice, though, is that the electrical conductivity is incredibly low here, all right? So very high over here in, the, in, in delta stream and very low over here. Well, one of the things that's interesting is that the, the glacier end member is at about 20 microsiemens, so incredibly dilute, as you would expect. <clears throat> so somehow along the path from glacier to, to stream gauge, 11 kilometers later, we really increase the electrical conductivity. And part of that is due to um, hyperreic exchange. So we do have this active layer thaw that occurs. It's about uh, generally a meter or less, particularly around streams. And, and so we can exchange water through um, these unconsolidated sediments for the most part, and um, as, as we go from glacier to lake here. Um, what that drives from doing a fair bit of modeling using some um, synoptic surveys that we did 
uh, with silica, we have some of the highest weathering rates for silicates reported um, in the literature. I was just comparing to some of these sort of classic studies at Lockvale and, and Taweta. Um, and I know that blows away a lot of uh, um, a lot of geochemists who have their head in or dedicated to dynamic principles. But the key here is that these are very fresh sediments. This was a lacustrine um, sediments from about 5,000 years ago. And uh, they really haven't seen water in a long time. They've been moved around by glaciers. They're fresh, and they see very little water. So they are ready to, uh, to, to weather. So very high weathering rates. All right, um, what do we do with all this data now? So we can start to look at some typical things. Here are um, exceedance probability curves for, uh, for discharge from long streams. And you'll see we have, we have completely removed the, the flow in between seasons, right? So, so even during a season, we see that harnish doesn't flow very often, right? So, so we've removed the summer, but, but the austral summer is included here. Um, we've removed the, the austral winter. Um, and so we see a lot less consistency um, and lower median flows compared to short streams. They're more consistent. And part of that is the hyperreic sponge that you've got to fill to be able to keep water moving downstream. If we do this with electrical conductivity, we notice that long streams, this is a log scale, we have much higher median uh, electrical conductivity values on long streams and short streams. And again, that comes back to the same example we looked at between the long and short stream, um, Delta and, and uh, Canada, um, and it also comes back to that, that weathering concept. So we can use electrical conductivity as a surrogate then for weathering, and we get those, those uh, measurements every 15 minutes. So that's a really dense data set that we can work with. And one of the things that we've done is just done some really simple in-member mixing models. We say, okay, the, the, the highest um, observations of, of electrical conductivity in the subsurface have been on the order of about um, you know three to four hundred microsiemens. Um, this this basin is fairly in the Frixel basin in particular. It's what I like to call homogeneously heterogeneous. So we've got all these silicates around. If we use you know a high end member there and a low end member for the glacier, we can look at this hyperreic proportion or the hyperreic labeling of water just using electrical conductivity and and mixing between highs and lows, right? So between 20 and say you know three or four hundred. And so on the right, this hyperreic proportion goes from zero to one, and there's much more hyperreic label, so to speak, or influence on the long streams than the short streams. And that's the ability to exchange through a lot more of that sponge, so to speak, that's interacting. So one of the things that we're doing next with this is trying to figure out, okay, what does this mean for going back to nutrient concentrations and, um, and perhaps uh, even metabolism to try to understand what the influence of the hyperreic zone then is on, on those processes. We can also take a step um, across time and look at four different streams. These are two long streams, Vongera and uh, Delta, and two short streams, Green and Canada. So over a 10-year uh, period for each of those, um, those records, this is the proportion of water that went through the hyperreic zone with a little bit of, of uh, for, for the total flow that went down each one of these streams, um, with a little bit of an error bar here. And you know they don't, they don't look too different, but if we flip those and start to look at the proportion of water, so we divide by the total, you know, that's a lot more going through Delta and, and Vongera again than Green in Canada. So this is a unique place where we can really look at that hyperreic influence and have almost a hyperreic tracer, essentially. All right, so that's one example. Um, another example of using our long-term data is to try to understand what happens when interesting things happen. So um, in 2002, my colleagues here, um, I was not part of this paper, but there was a paper in Nature that came out that got um, a lot of attention from people who didn't want to believe in global warming at the time. And it, it, was, it was about Antarctic cooling. And everybody focuses on these first three words of this title, but what's really interesting about this paper are actually the last three, the terrestrial ecosystem response to cooling. But um, that paper was focused on this period of time from 1987 to about 2000. And during that time, these are lake level changes since 1972. And you can see that the lake levels were kind of on the increase, and then they really started to decrease. They were dropping off, right? These are the three lakes in the, in the Taylor Valley. And wouldn't you know it, that paper came out right here where this step change occurs. That's what we call our flood year. So Peter's paper comes out in January of 2002, and we are having a flood year. Water is going everywhere. And you know, we're sort of trying to say, yeah, it's, it's, but, it's, but it's been cooling over the past uh, two decades, so that's really important, right? Even though we're all sort of swimming um, that, that particular year. Well, um, what's interesting now is to go back and look at a decade of, of data since that time. And this is the cooling trend for uh, mean summer air temperatures on the left-hand side, uh, austral summer, and, and the solar flux during that period, too. And so solar flux was increasing. Um, 
the temperatures were decreasing. Discharge was decreasing as well. This is a sum of all of the gauges that we have in the Frickville Basin added up. And so this was a statistically significant decrease through time. Here's the flood year. And look at what happened after the flood year. Like, everything has stayed consistent. It hasn't really, the, the temperatures haven't fluctuated much, or the means haven't in the summer. And we've had this high radiation condition. And, and then look at what the response is down here. We have um, some low flow years, some high, a couple of really nice high flow years. But overall, the mean has really increased. We are getting more melt now than we were in this decade prior to the flood year. So we, we are looking at a lot of the ecological responses to this, but it's really got us thinking about what could be driving this. If it's not clearly the radiation or the temperature, um, could be something else. And so we've, we've gone back to the Onyx River started its, uh, the New Zealand program started running a gauge here in 1968. So here's the 1970 through 2014 data, 15 data, and there's that flood year in the Onyx River. Um, here's the um, Antarctic Oscillation Index through as long as it's been recorded, right? And so we look at sort of comparing these two, we see that a high um, uh, Antarctic Oscillation Index is correlated or seems to be related to these really high flow years on the Onyx River. Um, and, and then the flip side, if we start to look at ozone, where we've got data, and again, these, are, these data I think are almost comparable to this. I can't remember when this record starts. But these red are, are basically these, these one, two, three, four, or five high flow years past 2002. And we see that they are um, at a time when we have very low ozone, total column ozone, over our part of the continent. So it's starting to beg the question, does UV matter? And if you talk to a physicist or if you've taken snow hydrology, UV should not matter for pure ice. But we have dirty ice. We have dirty ice at the surface of these glaciers. Maybe UV is interacting with those pollutants or those, those um, contaminants within the ice and driving some, some melt early. So we're, we're spending some time looking at that. So that's vignette number two. And the last vignette here I'll show, which is pretty spectacular, is just to simply look at um, uh, permafrost degradation. This is a, um, some buried ice. Um, that has been around for uh, since the last glacial maximum, and it has it has started. There's a river between where this picture is being taken and that that uh, uh, face back there, and basically the river is starting to undercut all of this ice now and expose it. And so it has rapidly changed uh, quite quickly. Um, at a smaller scale, in 2012, a colleague of mine and I went out to um, to we we have a camp set up right over here, and we walked over to uh, Crescent Stream, which is right here, and we said. Well, this is weird. Where did all this sediment come from? It's, our, our gauge was sort of covered in sediment. So we're going to focus on this. I'm going to note that we have a, a west fork and an east fork of Crescent Stream here. They come together, and then we have a, a stream gauge set up before that goes into, the, into Lake Frickville there. Um, and, and, you know, it just seemed really strange. So we started walking. Here's, it's kind of hard to see. This orange box is the gauge. We started walking up, and we noticed that there was a bunch of sediment in this channel. So, so these are sort of north is up here, and so we came up this west fork. The east fork didn't have any impact. But what we found on the west fork was this, which is really, this may not seem really, really surprising to people like Gordon who live in the northwest who have seen, you know, massive rain on snow events and, and all kinds of sediment mobilized. But this has been considered a really stable landscape. So these are pretty incredible changes for us that we've never seen in 20 years of working at this place. So I'll just show you some, some horrific eye candy here. Um, we have some undercutting of the banks and some slumping. Um, this was all very recent. It had happened within about 10 days of us finding this, and we're still in progress. What we think happened was essentially um, a bunch of, uh, there was an ice dam somewhere upstream that just happened to collect enough water behind it and then, and then rush through to cause a bunch of, of undercutting on the banks. This is actually a little, there's, a, there's an inlet to this tunnel up here comes out down here, and this water um, was muddy, murky, um, but it also had um, some really interesting chemistry that we'll look at in just a second. So um, putting up a tape here, this is about 58 centimeters just from this point. I couldn't quite figure out where the base level was before, so kind of guessed in the middle of that slope. But you know, 56, 57 centimeters of, of uh, um, degradation here is pretty substantial. And, and where we were down at the gauge is where a lot of that this transported material was getting deposited. So, so we started taking some samples that day and for the rest of the period. We found this in January 10th. I think we had to be out of the field in another 10 days. So we were trying to kind of get everything else done and come and sample this some. So we have, um, so what I'm going to show you is the East Fork 
had no thermocarst impact at all, none of this permafrost degradation. West Fork did. And so if we look at comparing the long-term records, about 45 um, samples from 15 years at the gauge, here's the mean and the, the range of those data. Um, you know, the sodium, the uh, calcium, chloride, and sulfate, they were all kind of in that range um, for the East Fork that had no impact. Um, on the West Fork, or where we, after the thermocarst occurred, or below that point here at the green, before these two tributaries come together, very high um, sodium uh, concentrations. Calcium wasn't, wasn't mixed in so much. Uh, chloride was very high, so we're mobilizing these salts. And the sulfate was elevated, but not really out of the historic range. What's more important for us to think about in the context of, of um, an, e uh, an LTER is thinking about these nutrients. So if we look at nitrate, um, ammonium, and phosphate, our nitrate levels were low, you know, at the, in the East Fork, so there was clearly not, not much going on from a source perspective. But if we look at what happened from the thermocarst impact, so down here, um, the orange and the, and the green here, um, you know, we had much, uh, quite elevated nitrate values uh, right here at this, right below all the thermocarst impact, and really high, you know, not, not out of bounds, but pretty high phosphate levels as well. So, so these are, there's some potential, you know, significant impact to these, these stream channels, not only um, with the sediment input, but what weathers quickly from accessing more sediments that had otherwise been quite dry um, without any you know, hill slope flow uh, through time. So with that, the penguin reminds me then to wrap up. And, that, and, and I just want to sort of recap and emphasize that you know, with our long-term data, one of the things that you can do is you know, start to make analyses that, that don't it can be corroborated in more than one season or more than one day. Um, in this context, we can, um, from the flood work, look at how um, the system responded prior to and after a big event. And we can certainly do the same with our um, thermocarst input in thinking about how much that of an impact that has, uh, given the historical um, data we have. So with that, I'll wrap up by um, acknowledging the uh, National Science Foundation, obviously, for um, uh, providing the, the grants, but also the U.S. Antarctic program for providing logistics. They've always been top-notch in um, you know, facilitating great science um, in Antarctica, and uh, I think these, we strive to make sure that these contributions are beyond Antarctica, that there are ways to uh, think about how to put them in context in other places, even in your local watershed. So um, we'll continue to do that. But thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take questions. Oh, wait, it's break time. Oh, sorry. Marcus. Oh, Marcus. Starting with you. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, well, so a simple answer is yes. We, you know, there's been a lot of documented hyperreic exchange in a lot of other systems. What's unique about this, I think, that we can use um, electrical conductivity as a tracer, or even if we said silica or something, is because we don't have other sources, right? If you were in a catchment around here, you'd have hill slope flow and deeper groundwater and so forth. So this simplified system allows us to really look at that, which is is fun, but I recognize it is a little bit unique. So. You know, we'll hopefully put it out there, and then your students will pick this up and go, oh, I could do this in the Alps or something. So. The caffeine is given up. Oh, Todd. So we don't we don't monitor deposition regularly. We when when somebody has a specific question about that sort of further end member mixing with something in particular, they may want to go look at um, gather snow. But but one of the things um, uh, I had a really good answer while you were talking. Um, we so we and we don't have NADP. Um, oh, but one of the stronger controls that we seem to see with that's related to stream nutrient concentrations in particular is that from the Frickville Basin to the Bonnie Basin, the soils, the, the soils group has extensively examined the, the uh, concentration of, of phosphate and nitrate. And what you see is high nitrate, low phosphate in, in Frickville, 
and then and then it, it, it drop the nitrate drops down as you go to Bonnie further inland and the reverse happens with phosphate so it's a really cool that seems to be correlate or related to um, the same concentration dynamic in the streams so there is you know a, a parent um, influence there from the soils even though we're not really running through a lot of those soils to begin with that water so it's a great question I think we flush a lot of that out early in the season we do get a lot of atmospheric salt deposition and so forth the winter. Oh, Gordon. In terms of data, the systematic evidence or statistics just in the explanation of the correlation Well, they are, in a way, two different experiments in how polar systems change, partly because of the ice dynamics. So the ice in, the, in, in Antarctica is largely on the continent, right? There's a big reflector that's always there, and the sea ice extends and, and changes each, each season. In the Arctic, it's the reverse, where you've got the, the land ringing the outside, and that Arctic Ocean then is in the middle, and so you get the positive feedback of warming up that water and reducing the ability to make sea ice that then sort of um, is a positive feedback that goes year to year to year. In the Antarctic, we, we have such a big reflector that we're not changing, right? We're not, we're not seasonally removing enough of it to have that positive feedback down there. So that's, I think that's part of the effort or part of the issue. But the other part is that there are much broader complex, and I alluded to it with the, um, this Antarctic Oscillation Index, that you know, the, 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 there is much more land mass, and, and I'm not a, um, atmospheric scientists, but it strikes me that there's a lot more connection between the Arctic uh, circulation patterns and the northern hemisphere than the Antarctic being surrounded by a whole lot of ocean and its potential to get a lot of warming to, to move down that way. But, um, you know, the John, John um, oh, his name escapes me, Zip Bass, the British Antarctic Survey, just put out a paper in Nature this past week that said that there's been a warming pause on the Antarctic Peninsula. Well, I mean, I would say we had for the past decade a cooling pause, but I don't expect us to go back to cooling in our co corner of the continent. I think it's much more likely that, that we're probably going to start heading um, up, if, if anything. But, um, but that'll, that'll depend on you know, local sea ice conditions and the broader climatological setup each year across the continent. So. Much more work needs to be done. <laughs> I, Tom's still in the room, so, you know. <laughs> Thank you. So we're about eight minutes late, um, but I think that's okay. So let's still start at 10:30 with our workshops, and um, and there's a break out there now. <laughs>